That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Our first question from Jackson Carlow. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, the First Minister confirmed this week that she wants not just one referendum next year, but two. Now, given she's ignored the result of the last two, why would anyone believe she would behave differently this time round? First Minister. Well, I'm rumbled uh, because I want, I want the people of Scotland to be able to escape a Tory Brexit that will damage our economy, damage our society, damage the prospects of future generations. I want Scotland to be able to escape years and years and years of further Tory wrangling on Brexit. And yes, I want the people of Scotland to have the opportunity to choose their own future. And I'll seek to persuade the people of Scotland in that choice to choose independence so that we can build the more prosperous, fairer, more equal Scotland that I believe we are capable of being. And I can't understand why anybody on any of these benches would not want exactly the same thing. Jackson Carlo. Interestingly, the one thing the First Minister didn't say there was that she would behave any differently if she lost next time round. And she's always confident she's going to win a referendum. The track record shows she always loses. Yeah. And I'm asking, yeah. I'm asking because I'm just not sure the First Minister has thought through her big double referendum promise. As she keeps telling us, she would ask Jeremy Corbyn for a referendum on independence and demand it's held next year. And we know too that she would support Mr Corbyn's plan for a second Brexit referendum also to be held next year. Yep. Now, First Minister, clarify for me a simple question on timetabling. When is all this supposed to happen? Both referendums on the one day or on different days, which vote would come first? Indyref, Euroref, which? First Minister. Well, my priority, and I can't believe Jackson Carlow hasn't actually cottoned on to this yet. You should maybe listen a bit more. My priority is to give the people of Scotland the opportunity to choose independence next year. Uh, and I look forward to delivering on that. Uh, but Jackson Carlow is also mistaken when it comes to uh, past referendums because he also uh, might conveniently be forgetting this fact. In the 2016 Brexit referendum, I campaigned for Remain. Actually, memory tells me so did Jackson Carlow. <laughs> and Scotland voted to remain in the EU by 62%. That's the referendum result I want to see honoured. The question for Jackson Carlaw is why is he so willing to ignore how people in Scotland voted on that question? Jackson Carlaw. You heard it from the First Minister there. Her priority used to be education. Now it's independence. <laughs> and, and I'm not surprised the First Minister can't answer the basic question here because, frankly, none of it makes sense. Not only is Nicola Sturgeon going to demand a second independence referendum be held next year, as well as supporting a second Brexit referendum, she's also telling people that she's going to help form what she grandly describes as a progressive alliance yeah. with other parties across the UK. That's the same UK, if we follow her rightly, that she hopes to leave weeks later. Now, I'm intrigued. Can the First Minister explain how you can hope to form an alliance with the same people you're planning to walk out on? Yeah. First Minister. I think Jackson Carlaw has probably confused himself with that question as well as the rest of the, the population. But can I say, firstly, Jackson Carlaw asked me what my priority was between different referendums, and I made clear to him, and I'll do it again, my priority is to give the people of Scotland the opportunity to choose independence. Secondly, perhaps Jackson Carlaw might reflect... Perhaps Jackson Carlaw might reflect on this. If referendums uh, are so dreadful, according to him, why did David Cameron the Tory Prime Minister at the time foist a Brexit referendum on Scotland. And thirdly, yes, I would want to be part of a progressive alliance to lock Tories out of government in Westminster. Why? Because Tories wreak misery and havoc. It's a year today, presiding officer, since Theresa May presented her Brexit deal to her cabinet, unleashing a year of chaos and division at the hands of the Tories. Welfare cuts, austerity, pushing more and more children into poverty. No right-minded person across this country would want anything other than an alternative to that Tory mis misery. Jackson Carlaw. I see we're back to our shouty megaphone inclusive speech making, First Minister. Um, all this is complete nonsense from you, but helpfully, your colleague and close ally, David Linden, last night did clarify he matters. Because he, he revealed even if the UK stayed in the European Union after a second vote, the SNP would come up with yet more reasons for a grievance rematch on independence anyway. 
So after Indy Ref 2, it would be Indy Ref 3, then Indy Ref 4. Everyone knows we'd be doing the Indy Ref forever. All the grand talk of alliances is just a nationalist game. Unlike some in this chamber, the Scottish Conservatives aren't buying it. We'll stand up for Scotland's lifetime decision to stay in the UK. Isn't the real question here why she and Jeremy Corbyn are refusing to do so? First Minister. Presiding officer, Scottish Tories have never stood up for Scotland in their puff. And we've seen ample evidence of that over the past three and a half years since Scotland voted to remain in the European Union and that vote was ignored and has been ignored every single day by the Conservatives. But I want to put uh, Jackson Carlaw's mind at rest uh, on one thing. Uh, I believe Scotland will vote for independence when it comes to Indy Ref 2, so we will not have to worry about any uh, further occasions. But let me be absolutely candid because I can't believe Jackson Carlaw or anybody else is in any doubt about this. I support independence for Scotland. Um, and yes, I do want Scotland to escape a position where we are having our futures imposed upon us by Boris Johnson. Uh, Boris Johnson, who is now having his strings pulled by Nigel Farage. The Tory party is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Nigel Farage and the Brexit party. So I don't want that to be Scotland's future. I want the people of Scotland to have the opportunity to choose their own future. I want the people of Scotland to have the opportunity to choose independence so that we can build the kind of Scotland that we know we are capable of becoming. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. This week, new figures published by the charity Education Support revealed that more than a third of those working in education in Scotland have experienced mental health issues in the past 12 months, and that more than half have considered leaving the sector due to pressures on their health and well-being over the past two years. First Minister, after more than 12 years in office, Scotland schools have faced plummeting investment and a recruitment and workload crisis. The health of our teachers is being harmed, but our children's education and life chances are being harmed too. So what does the Scottish Government intend to do to change this? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, we value uh, our teachers. We value the contribution our teachers make to the education of our young people day in and day out. Investment in education is rising in Scotland, and rightly so. Uh, we have also given teachers uh, the best paid deal uh, of any of the UK countries. Uh, as part of that uh, pay deal, uh, we've also taken steps uh, and additional measures that are aimed at addressing issues relating to workload, wellbeing uh, and teacher empowerment. Uh, so we're taking uh, the action uh, designed to make sure our teachers have the support they need to deliver what they are required to deliver for our pupils. And of course, uh, when it comes to uh, attainment in our schools, uh, all of the evidence uh, and much of this evidence is cited in these exchanges on a regular basis shows that attainment is rising. I had an exchange with Jackson Carlaw about this last week and there is a, a blog published in the last couple of days by the Professor of Education at Stirling University uh, who himself, uh, somebody I should say that is not without criticisms of Curriculum for Excellence, but himself says that the evidence says that at, at national fives and at hires attainment is rising. So the narrative that the Tories, uh, aided and abetted as usual by Labour, uh, want to put across about Scottish education simply is not borne out by the facts. Sorry, uh, Richard, Richard Leonard. Well, there are 3,000 fewer teachers now than when the SNP took office. <laughs> and it's not just teachers. It's not just teachers who are considering leaving their profession. Today, Unison Scotland launched a new report based on a survey conducted of social work teams in Scottish local authorities. It reports that 90% of staff are considering walking out of their jobs in social work. And is it any wonder? Here is just one social worker's experience, and I quote, we are under pressure to hit savings targets Many staff are stressed to the point of their own health being compromised, resulting in higher risk of poor care. Time spent with vulnerable adults is too short, so many are lonely and depressed. 
Many staff work extra hours without pay just to get jobs done. Unison told the BBC this morning that the service is at breaking point. So what does the Scottish Government intend to do to change this? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, to uh, finish off on teachers, there are 1,200 more teachers in our schools than there were when I became First Minister. Uh, we're, putting more money, we're putting more money into education and we're rewarding our teachers for the job that they do. In terms of uh, social workers, and I welcome the Unison report, it is always important that we study uh, evidence like this uh, carefully, but uh, we've seen a 5.4% increase in the numbers of practising social workers since 2008. Uh, the uh, workforce has uh, increased and uh, as uh, the latest official statistics for the social services workforce show at the end of 2017, which is the latest figures we've got, it was the largest it has been since 2008. We've provided over £25 million to support the training of social workers over the past five years. We're investing heavily in mental health support services. And I would say to Richard Leonard, we're doing all of this, and we have been doing all of this in the face of continued Tory austerity, um, which begs the question, again, uh, why, if Richard Leonard is, as I believe he is, concerned about the impacts of austerity, why he wants to keep Scotland's future in the hands of Tory governments at Westminster, rather than allow Scotland to take more of these decisions ourselves? Richard Leonard. Uh, well, to state the obvious, um, I don't want to see the future in the hands of the Tories. I want to see the future in the hands of a Labour government. <laughs> and, and, I just, and I just hope that the First Minister listens to the first-hand real-life experiences of these people who are delivering these services. These are voices that deserve to be listened to. Two weeks ago, I raised with the First Minister the growing crisis of mental health stress and anxiety amongst NHS workers. And today the human cost to Scotland's education workers and social workers and social work teams is also plain to see. So isn't it clear that these working people and the people who depend on the critical services that they provide are being let down because of decisions that this government has taken? Scotland's public services desperately need investment. Investment that you, First Minister, have failed to deliver, but a Labour government will. But last night, you threatened to bring down a Labour government. So, First Minister, why don't you admit that what Scotland needs is a decade of investment under Labour, not the decade of cuts prescribed in your blueprint for an independent Scotland? First Minister. My goodness, you can always tell when Scottish Labour is desperate when they take themselves right back to 1979. Absolutely. The fact of the matter is, I'll never, I'll never put Hard the Tories or support the Tories in power, unlike Labour, who actually prefer Tory government at Westminster than self-government for Scotland. <laughs> Something that is utterly inexplicable. And on the question, uh, of teachers, of NHS workers, of social workers. Uh, we take very seriously uh, the stresses and strains that all of these public service workers uh, operate under. Uh, they do a fantastic job and they deserve our support. But that is why we are taking the action we are, increasing the number of teachers, increasing their pay, putting more money into education, increasing the number of social workers uh, and increasing the number of people working in our NHS with record funding to our national health service. So these are the actions we will continue to take, supporting public service workers right across the country instead of the empty rhetoric we get day after day from Labour. Thank you. We've got quite a number of constituency questions uh, today. The first from Edward Mountain to be followed by Anasawa. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week I asked the First Minister about the poor financial management of NHS Highland. In the past, I've asked her about the appalling bullying in NHS Highland. This time I rise to ask about the 78-week delay for orthopaedic operations in NHS Highland, with only 54% of patients getting operations within the treatment time guarantee. First Minister, what have you asked the Cabinet Secretary to, to do to resolve these serious issues? First Minister. 
Well, I, I would hope Edward Mountain would be uh, very familiar with the actions the Health Secretary is taking in terms of uh, the allegations around bullying, the Sturrock report uh, that looked at these issues in NHS Highland. We work closely with NHS Highland and indeed other boards in terms of their financial management and we're putting record uh, funding into uh, the health service and there is an £850 million uh, waiting times initiative targeting uh, waits that are too long in the NHS. And of course, the most recent Audit Scotland report, uh, while it had many important things to say, uh, also recognised that in the face of rising demand, uh, performance was improving against most of these waiting times targets. And I start to be followed by Christine Graham. Presenting officer, something is seriously wrong at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital campus. Since its opening, there have been a series of scandals, but this one has broken me. I have had information shared with me which shows senior managers have been repeatedly alerted to the fact that a previous review failed to include cases of infection related to the water supply in 2017. Central to this whistleblowing evidence is that there were 26 infections at the children's cancer ward and in one case a child died as a result. To this day, the parents have never been told. This isn't just a scandal, it's a heartbreaking human tragedy. First Minister, Cabinet Secretary, you aren't being told the truth. I implore you, for the sake of the staff who've been put in this unforgivable situation, for the sake of all the patients who use this hospital, for the sake of public trust in our institutions, but most of all, for the sake of those parents, particularly of the child that has lost their life, will you please personally intervene to seek answers, to get justice for the families, and to take the necessary actions so this never happens again? First Minister. Well, firstly, the Health Secretary is uh, personally involved in all of these issues and uh, regularly keeps me appraised uh, of uh, developments. I, firstly, can't even begin to imagine the pain for families that have lost loved ones. Uh, and it is because of that that we are absolutely determined that these matters are fully investigated. Uh, the government has been working closely with uh, the health board and staff on the issue of infections in recent months and that work will continue to ensure that the health board is doing all it needs to do to maintain a safe environment for patients. Patient safety is paramount and that is exactly why the health secretary commissioned an independent review to look at the design build commissioning and maintenance of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and of course also why on the 18th of September a public inquiry uh, into uh, these issues that have arisen at that hospital and indeed the sick kids in Edinburgh was announced. Uh, we are determined to address the concern of patients and families uh, and the Health Secretary of course has committed to returning to Parliament to set out the full details of the public inquiry uh, as soon as possible. Christine Graham to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I have been contacted by distressed and angry constituents who have partners with dementia and advanced dementia who found themselves with no suitable care packages in place when Scottish Borders Council closed its day centres with assessments only being done after the closures. Is there a role here for the Scottish Government or is it just to be left to the vagaries of the Scottish Borders Council? First Minister. Uh, well, obviously there are responsibilities uh, of the Council here and uh, indeed integrated health and social care partnerships, uh, but if, I would be very happy to ask the Health Secretary to look into the particular circumstances of this uh, because it is of course the case, uh, and rightly so, that the Government takes a very close interest in how uh, patients are being dealt with, how delayed discharges are being tackled to ensure that patients are getting the care that they need in the place and in the setting that is most appropriate for their needs. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures have shown a 63% increase in the number of aggressive confrontations reported by Fife Education staff last year. Clearly, any violence in the workplace should not be tolerated, and the level of violence and aggression towards teaching staff is clearly unacceptable. The EIS has recommended additional training for teaching staff on how to deal with aggressive situations. What action will the First Minister take to ensure that? First Minister. Well, any violence in any workplace, obviously including schools, is completely unacceptable and that should be the very clear message that comes from all of us. The Education Secretary uh, worked closely, liaises closely with the EIS and will take any uh, suggestion that the EIS makes around training very seriously uh, and I'm sure the Education Secretary would be happy to update the member uh, on this particular issue. 
Rhoda Grant to be followed by Keith Brown. The First Minister will be aware of the chaos that has been caused in the Western and Argyll Islands due to the breakdown of the Loch Seaforth and inadequate ferry provision. This has been exacerbated by boats being moved onto routes that are not suitable, meaning that they cannot sail in poor weather. Earlier this week, 25 out of the 28 services were affected. Will she now listen to islanders and ensure that there are enough boats suitable to provide these lifeline services? First Minister. Well, we monitor the performance of all of the lifeline ferry operators very closely. Um, service disruption uh, on uh, Monday the 11th of November was mainly due to poor weather conditions and of course the decision to delay or cancel a sailing is never taken lightly by any operator. Uh, we are investing and have been investing heavily uh, in ferry services uh, despite the reductions in our budget. The Scottish Government has invested over £2 billion, um, in the Clyde and Hebrides services, the Northern Isles ferry services and ferry infrastructure since 2007 and we will continue to do so to make sure uh, that our island communities have the lifeline services that they require. And Keith Brown. Uh, the First Minister will, will be aware that the latest four-month average waiting time figures for a and &E across Scotland, including Fort Valley Health Board, is over 90%, over which shows obviously the pressures on the NHS uh, and the achievements of NHS staff. But is she also aware of the figures released today, this morning, that show in England an average of 83%, the lowest, record, the lowest recorded figure on record. And does she believe, as I do, that this shows there is one government in the UK committed to doing the day job and it's not this incompetent Tory UK government? Briefly, First Minister. I'm not sure, well, I am sure actually why the Tories are getting a bit edgy uh, yes. about this question. Yeah. Um, these are serious matters. Uh, our A&E services are under pressure um, and those who work uh, in them do a fantastic job. Our A&E services have performed better uh, than those in other parts of the UK now for four and a half years and that is to the credit of everybody who works in our NHS. I, I think the figures published in England today of course are a matter of concern. There are great pressures on the NHS in England as is the case here in Scotland but Conservatives and Labour get um, a bit upset when we compare the performance of the Sc Scottish NHS to that in England and Wales. Uh, but of course, the reason we do that is because both of them, both of them claim that if they were in government in Scotland, the NHS would be performing better. So it's reasonable to look at where the Tories are in government in England and the NHS is doing worse, and where Labour is in government in Wales, where the NHS is also doing worse. The Scottish NHS is the best performing, certainly in accident and emergency, in the whole of the UK. I know Labour and the Tories don't like it, but patients across Scotland certainly do. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. I hope the whole chamber will share my horror at the court of session ruling yesterday that CERCO's despicable policy of lock change eviction of asylum seekers is lawful. If it is lawful, we must certainly still say that it isn't right. It effectively strips people of their human rights and puts them at immediate risk of street homelessness. That includes people like Mohammed and Khadija, a married couple in their 70s with severe health problems who are among those facing being turfed out into the streets in the middle of winter. Greens believe that we must treat all those who arrive on our shores seeking refuge with dignity and compassion. And I think most people in Scotland share that view. The Scottish Government's statement said, we will consider the implications of the judgment, but this is urgent. Can the First Minister tell us what immediate actions the Scottish Government will take in response to this humanitarian crisis? First Minister. Well, we'll uh, liaise closely with Glasgow City Council. I agree with Patrick Harvey. I am horrified at the implications of this judgment. Uh, if uh, lock change evictions are legal, and of course the Human Rights Act is uh, reserved uh, to Westminster, but if they are legal, they certainly are not moral. Um, and that is the key issue. Uh, but let's be clear about this. We've ended up in this situation because of an inhumane and degrading UK government asylum system, which is leaving people destitute and homeless uh, in the country where they have sought refuge. And we should be uh, giving refuge to people who are fleeing some of the uh, worst circumstances uh, that any of us can imagine. Uh, so first and foremost, we need uh, a long-term sustainable solution uh, to uh, asylum so that we have a humane system in place. In the meantime, the Scottish Government will do everything we can within our powers to ensure that we're providing the care and help that asylum seekers uh, need and the Community Secretary uh, will be liaising 
closely uh, with stakeholders to see how we can best support people who have been placed in this situation by an inhumane asylum system. Uh, longer term, and I hope it's not uh, too uh, long term, uh, what we really need is control over immigration and asylum here in this parliament so we can build from scratch, as we're doing right now with social security, a system that has humanity, respect and dignity at its very heart. Patrick Harvey. Well, I agree that it's the UK government's inhumane and degrading hostile environment that's at the root of this tragedy. They're using destitution as a deliberate policy tool and it's morally indefensible. But what people need in the here and now is not that long-term solution. We should be striving for it, but what people need in the here and now is somewhere to stay. We can't simply accept what the UK government is doing to people and the Scottish government can and must respond. In November last year, I asked questions about this situation because we knew this crisis was coming. And the First Minister told me that the Scottish Government would take the action that is necessary to prevent a humanitarian crisis. But adequate emergency accommodation is still not in place. And we know that at least 150 people face imminent eviction and homelessness in the winter months ahead. We know who's to blame for the brutality of UK asylum policy, but what these people need is not someone to blame. What they need is shelter, food, warmth, health care and support. This is an urgent crisis and we have a demand for a rapid humanitarian response to ensure that these basic needs are met. When will the First Minister be able to confirm that arrangements are in place, including emergency accommodation for all those who need it now? First Minister. Uh, can I say to Patrick Harvey in all sincerity, this is not simply about trying to apportion blame. This is about being clear where, firstly, responsibility and secondly, legal powers lie. The Scottish Government, and I think our record speaks for itself on this, we will do everything we possibly can to shield uh, people, asylum seekers, those who have sub been subjected to welfare cuts uh, from the implications of policies that we consider are inhumane and that we deeply disagree with. And, uh, Aileen Campbell will be happy to liaise with Patrick Carvey about what is possible in a practical sense working with Glasgow City Council. We will leave no stone unturned within the legal powers that we have. But I don't, and Patrick Harvey doesn't either, do anybody any favours if we are not clear about what the root of this problem is, because otherwise we will not be providing the real solutions that people need. So short term, we'll do everything we can. He has my absolute assurance on that. But if we are to solve this problem, we need to get the powers over this out of the hands of a Tory government uh, that is leading to this kind of thing and into the hands of a parliament uh, that will build a system that doesn't have these inhumane consequences built into it right from the start. Question number four, Willie Rennie. The police staff survey helps us understand the welfare of people across the force. But it is now three years late. The delay is making people suspicious that it's going to be bad news for the police. The last survey showed that only tiny numbers believed that the force cared about their welfare. So we have investigated ourselves. We found that the number of working days lost to mental ill health has gone up 11% in just two years for police officers. For police staff, it's 25%. So what do these shocking numbers say about the state of our police six years after centralisation? First Minister. Uh, well, in terms of the staff survey, I'll be happy to uh, write to Willie Rennie about details about when exactly uh, that will be happening. But overall, our police, like our NHS workers, like social workers, like teachers in our schools, uh, clearly do jobs that are incredibly stressful. Police have been, uh, are receiving training uh, to deliver uh, brief distress interventions uh, to others. But the welfare of police is very important. That is exactly why uh, we have maintained police numbers at the level uh, well above that level that we inherited uh, when we came into office uh, in contrast to what has happened elsewhere. It is also why uh, we are ensuring that our police officers are properly rewarded for the job that they do, again through a pay increase uh, that is much greater uh, than elsewhere. And we will continue to work closely with the police service to make sure that they are equipped. We are protecting the revenue uh, budget in real terms of the police service over this parliament. So we will do uh, all of these things uh, to make sure that our 
police officers, like our other public sector workers, have the support that they deserve from their government. Willie Rennie. I'm afraid that's cold comfort for the staff of sick. Yeah. The chief superintendent in charge of policing in Tayside said that mental health was a huge amount of their demand. The Scottish Government promised new mental health staff working alongside the police to help them cope. In the last week, we have discovered that this adds up to a miserable seven and a half extra staff. People will be lucky if they've even seen them in the canteen, let alone worked with them. We have police off sick, massive demands on their time, just seven and a half extra staff to help them. It's just not good enough. Will the First Minister take off time from pontificating about other parties and her referendum and take practical action to increase mental health support for our police? First Minister. Well, given this is a serious matter, I will resist the temptation to uh, reflect on Willie Rennie and pontification. But anyway, moving on. Um, look, these are important issues, um, and that is why we are investing in our police service. We are investing in mental health support workers across a range of different settings. We've made a commitment to do that over this parliament, and we are delivering that commitment over this parliament. Uh, we have uh, a higher number of police officers than was the case when we came into government and we're maintaining it well above that level. Uh, we're investing in uh, policing resources. We're making sure our police service uh, is rewarded and we are also investing heavily in improving mental health services. Uh, one of the factors we talk about in the general population but it is also reflected in each of these public services is that people are more able now to come forward and seek help if they are suffering mental health difficulties. That is a good thing but it means we must continue to make the investment and improve the services available and we are very focused every single day on doing exactly that. The further supplementary questions, the first from James Kelly to be followed by Claire Adamson. James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention to reports in the Sunday Post that uh, rape victims whose mobile phones had been retained by Police Scotland for investigation purposes were still being charged by mobile phone companies? It is indeed scandalous that uh, women who are in enduring such a vulnerable experience are treated in such a hard-hearted manner. It's rightly been criticised, the mobile phone companies have rightly been criticised by Rape Crisis Scotland for profiteering from people who are enduring a traumatic experience. Uh, can I ask the First Minister to agree with me that mobile phone companies should immediately cease uh, charging rape victim victims in such circumstances and also to ensure that Police Scotland review and update the procedures to properly support rape victims in such, uh, in such situations. First Minister. Well, I, I do think this is an important issue, and I, I certainly share the concerns of Rape Crisis Scotland about this. Um, if I can uh, deal with the police and mobile phone companies separately, though I know these issues are connected. Uh, investigation of crime, of any crime, is a matter for the police, but I am very clear and senior officers have been very clear uh, that uh, a rape victim's phone should only be withheld for as long as it is required for an evidential uh, reason. Um, Secondly, on mobile phone companies, I do think it is unacceptable that mobile phone companies uh, are continuing to uh, charge uh, people whose phones have been held, withheld in this way. And I would expect companies to respond sympathetically and with care to individuals who might have experienced the trauma of rape or sexual assault and have had their phones taken as evidence. It's not uh, acceptable that they continue to be billed uh, for a phone that they are not in possession of and able uh, to use. So we will uh, continue to do what we can, uh, obviously working with the police, uh, respecting, of course, the operational independence of the police in investigating crime, uh, but also with mobile phone companies. And I'd be happy to ask the Justice Secretary uh, to update uh, the member later uh, once we've had the opportunity to take these issues forward. Claire Adamson to be followed by Liam Kerr. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister share my concern and disgust? The analysis of five years' worth of data shows that one in two ill or disabled people who appealed against their rights being denied to employment support allowance and disability benefits are successful at appeal. First Minister, this system is morally bankrupt and broken. Is it time that the Tory yeah. government started listening to the calls made for many years from this place and to the concerns of the UN rapporteur 
that people in our society who are in, ill and disabled need to be treated with dignity and respect. First Minister. Uh, I think uh, Claire Adamson is right to raise this issue. Uh, the number of appeals that are being upheld, and we see that from the data, I think does strongly suggest that the system is fundamentally broken and that it is working against the very people that it should be there to assist. And that is the exact opposite of the approach we're seeking to take with Scotland's social security system. Uh, people have repeatedly told the UK government uh, that the welfare system causes stress and anxiety. And while uh, employment and support allowance will remain reserved, uh, and I would urge uh, the UK government to listen carefully and to pay close attention to this evidence, uh, it is the case that we in the Scottish Government will start delivering disability benefits from next year. Uh, we've already committed to a number of improvements, including significantly reducing face-to-face -face assessments, and when they are necessary, providing a flexible service that works better uh, for the people relying on these benefits. And in addition, from the beginning of the application process, there will be a focus on gathering the right information to ensure that good decisions are taken from the start so that we don't then see the high number of appeals being overturned that is sadly the hallmark of the current DWP system. So finally, President Officer, I would urge the UK Government to pay close attention to this data and to take the action, perhaps learning from the approach we're taking here in Scotland, to put this right and like uh, the immigration system, like other aspects of the welfare system, to start to put some dignity and humanity and respect at its heart. Liam Kerr to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the First Minister rightly apologised to Tom Mason after misleading Parliament. Now, earlier this week, the SNP government boasted that youth unemployment had fallen, only for a leading economist from the Fraser Valander Institute to point out the figures were misleading. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to offer an apology for these further misleading statements? First Minister. Uh no, the stats that were uh, published uh, earlier this week and, and were referred to were stats that were published. They were the most up-to-date stats, the labour market uh, study. There are, of course, other stats that we also uh, look at as well. I, I don't particularly want to uh, get into what other people uh, tweet, but the economist in particular himself has tweeted the labour market stats around youth employment in past years. So, Obviously, all of us, particularly government ministers, given uh, the rules around official statistics, have to be very careful about how we use statistics. And the Scottish Government will always reflect on any comments or criticisms that are made. Uh, but these were figures that were published uh, earlier this week, and uh, the tweet referred to simply quoted uh, the published statistics, which were also official statistics. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister if she can provide an update in progress with the Ayrshire growth deal? which the Scottish Government is contributing £100 million pounds towards. First Minister. Uh, well, since we announced our £103 million pounds commitment to the Ayrshire Growth Deal in March, uh, the Scottish Government and our enterprise and skills agencies have worked with Ayrshire partners to help them develop the business cases that are necessary for us to agree a final deal in partnership with the UK Government. Uh, we will continue to match the ambition of our Ayrshire partners aiming to agree a final deal as soon as possible. Uh, as part of the Ayrshire Growth Deal programme, we have already approved the business case for Kilmarnock's HALO project, uh, which I know is in Willie Coffey's constituency, and I'm very pleased to note that work on that project has commenced, offering the prospect of hundreds of local jobs and a boost for businesses in the town. Question number five, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to promote equal pay among men and women. First Minister. In March this year, we launched a Gender Pay Gap Action Plan, which was the first of its kind in the UK. It has over 50 actions to tackle the root causes of the gender pay gap. A refreshed Scottish Business Pledge has as one of its three core elements to take action to address the gender pay gap. And this year we're providing £800,000 to 22 projects under the Workplace Equality Fund, uh, more than £200,000 to close the gap, and £159,000 to Family Friendly Working Scotland Partnership, all of which uh, will help make workplaces fairer and more flexible. It's incumbent on us to tackle uh, this further, indeed to uh, eradicate the gender pay gap, which is outrageous in this day and age. Uh, and of course we would be helped in doing that if all employment powers lay in the hands of this Scottish Parliament. Gillian Martin. Thank the First Minister for that answer. Today is Equal Pay Day, the day in the year when, based on data, women stop earning relative to men. 
To mark it, the Fawcett Society has launched a campaign to equip women with a legally enforceable right to know the basic pay information they need to work out whether they are being discriminated against. Mm. As we approach the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act, does the First Minister welcome this campaign and agree that women should not still be waiting for equal pay for equal work? First Minister. Uh, I do agree with that. This, of course, is Equal Pay Day, and it is shameful uh, that uh, what this day uh, says occurs uh, at this point in the year. Um, the Equal Pay Act, uh, and I hesitate to say this given Gillian Martin has just said it's approaching its 50th anniversary, but the Equal Pay Act was passed in the year I was born. Um, and it is outrageous uh, that 50, almost 50 years on, we still don't have equal pay in this country. Uh, so it is positive that the median gender pay gap has reduced by more than half over the 20 years of the life of this parliament. It's at 7% in Scotland, which is lower than the UK level, but there should be no gender pay gap at all. Uh, we cannot and will not have true gender equality as long as women are being paid less than men for the same work. So it's incumbent on all of us, uh, whether employers or government, to tackle this deep unfairness. Uh, a clear action that can be taken is to improve transparency and reporting uh, regulations. And we've called on the Scottish Government, uh, the UK Government rather, to do that because powers lie there. But we will continue to take action within our sphere of responsibility uh, to end this scourge once and for all. And Brian Whittle. Not Sorry, on. question six, Brian Whittle. Thank you. No. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to reduce levels of diabetes, heart disease and stroke among the over 65s. First Minister. We continue to implement the diabetes, heart disease and stroke improvement plans, which set out our priorities and actions to deliver improved prevention, treatment and care. Uh, these plans are making a difference between 2008 and 2018. The mortality rate for coronary heart disease decreased by 37.2% and for stroke decreased by 42.7%. We're also leading the way in the UK with innovative public health policies. Our diet and healthy weight delivery plan strives to make a significant impact on the prevention and remission of type 2 diabetes. And our tobacco action plan is delivering results as the smoking rate for adults has continued to fall. These policies strive to help people make healthier choices and support them to live healthier lives. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? I wonder if she's uh, aware of a recent report in, that is asking for gastric band surgery to be available on the NHS uh, for over 65 to address obesity-related diabetes, heart attacks and strokes. I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me that a better use of this resource would be to encourage and promote activities that help physical and mental well-being, such as walking football and walking netball and other such activities, and this, this should be the first step to tackling obesity long before any uh, promoting such invasive surgery. First Minister. Well, can I say first of all to Brian Whittle, well, I, I thank him for raising these issues. Bariatric surgery, uh, as it's called, as uh, he will be aware, is available on the NHS, but it will be a clinical decision as to whether it is appropriate for a particular uh, patient. And if it is clinically appropriate for a patient, it should be provided on the NHS. So I agree uh, with that. Uh, but secondly, I also agree that prevention is uh, the key here, and it's what we should be principally focused on, which is why the public health work that I spoke about is so important, as well as ensuring early diagnosis uh, of illness and good care and treatment. So the strategy that I already mentioned uh, is focused on all of these things and as we continue to take these actions I very much hope we will continue to see the reduced mortality rate uh, for heart disease and for stroke. Maureen Watt. Um, the First Minister will be aware that the Home Secretary Priti Patel has pledged the stories will cut overall immigration and end freedom sorry, of movement sorry, sorry, if Ms. Boris Watt. Johnson wins sorry, Ms. this Ms. election. Sorry, sorry to stop you, I thought you were pressing for a supplementary on this question. I'm afraid the the questions have to, uh, the supplementaries have to follow the question and it's on diabetes. I thought it's since on, time I know, was exactly, available. I'm afraid <laughs> this one's on diabetes and healthcare. <laughs> David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware that today is World Diabetes Day. Does the First Minister share Diabetes Scotland's view that all people living with diabetes should receive appropriate emotional, psychological and mental health support they need to self-manage their condition, as people with diabetes are twice as likely to experience depression? 
Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that, and the Scottish Government will continue to work to achieve uh, that aim. Uh, I would pay tribute to David Stewart. Uh, I know he's taken a long-standing interest in issues associated with diabetes. He uh, did that while I was Health Secretary, and uh, he will know as a result of that the work that the Scottish Government is doing to make sure that we reduce the incidence of diabetes, as I say, maximise reversal of type 2 diabetes, but also make sure the right support and services are there for people who are living with diabetes. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Ruth Maguire on the day of the imprisoned writer. But we're just going to have a short suspension to allow uh, some visitors to come into the gallery and for members to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>